Continuing our journey through the Bible, we are in Isaiah chapters 3 and 4. So study them over this afternoon. And then join with us tonight at 7 o'clock as we gather to worship the Lord and to continue our understanding of God as he has revealed himself through his word. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to Isaiah chapter 3 verses 10 and 11. As God is instructing the prophet Isaiah to speak to the people. And God said, say to the righteous that it shall be well with him. For they shall eat the fruit of their doings. But woe to the wicked. It shall be ill with him. For the reward of his hands shall be given him. God has been speaking to Isaiah concerning the coming Holocaust that the nation of Judah is going to be facing because they had turned their backs upon God. He tells them that they are going to experience a time of drought in which the heavens being shut up, the fresh water supplies would be depleted, And, of course, their grain crops would fail. Israel was a land that was blessed geographically. The scripture called it a land that was flowing with water, with milk, with honey. A land that brought forth and produced abundantly. And so they enjoyed always a surplus of grain. They enjoyed an abundance of water. But God said that he was going to begin to judge them and the first sign of the judgment would be a drought. A prolonged period in which they would not get sufficient rain until their reservoirs began to dry up. And then God was going to remove from them men of quality to rule over them. There would be a real deterioration of leadership within the nation. And unqualified people would begin to rule over them. The nation would be oppressed because of the lack of good, strong Leadership. They were to experience tremendous increase in their taxes to help support the failing government policies. Juvenile crime was going to rage out of control. The young people would be rebelling against the laws and they would rove in gangs assaulting any who would get in their way. And men with evil and corrupt minds would begin to oppress and oppose those who were seeking to maintain morality and righteousness. As the result, the land would be filled and flooded with pornography. The use of drugs would become widespread throughout every strata of the community. The place of God in the national life would be rejected. The judicial system would be corrupt and actually a place of support for evil doings as the judges would be taking bribes. In light of these things that were to happen, I cannot help but see the parallel that we are observing in our nation today. Though I read his lips Yet he declares that he's going to be raising our taxes very soon and very dramatically. We find that unqualified people have become the leaders of the nation. There's a breakdown of the judicial system. Young people are roving in gangs. We see violence spreading. We see pornography flooding the marketplace and drugs at epidemic proportions. And this week, 
we've had several interesting decisions come out of the courts. First of all, a school teacher in Florida has been forbidden by the courts to read the scriptures to the classroom any longer. It seems that each day she chose a passage of the scripture to read to the children. She's been doing that for many, many years, but now is forbidden to do that by the courts. This past week, the court system also ruled that the showing of filthy art in the public museum was all right. They could continue to do that. This past week, one of the coaches of the National Football League was fined $30,000 because he refused to allow a woman reporter in the locker room where the team was taking its showers after the game. A breakdown, indeed, of the system. Now, God said these were the things that were going to happen. They would be indicative of the judgment of God that was coming upon them as they began to reap the fruit of their doings. He said this basically is the reason why these calamities are going to come. Verse 8, Jerusalem is ruined, Judah is fallen, because, here's the reason, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. They began to deny the place of God in their national life. They began to deny the existence of a personal God. They began to teach that if God did exist, he was so far removed from man and from his creation that he was not concerned at all in his creation, that things just were allowed to develop as they would, and that he was some impersonal force far off in the universe, unconcerned with man. They were saying such things as, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? And they were speaking very disparagingly of God. Not only that, God said that their countenance would begin to bear witness against them. People don't seem to realize it, but it is true. Sin has a way of marking your countenance, as does righteousness. So that a person who is engaging in a sinful life, it is soon very obvious because it begins to show on his face. Those who live righteous, pure lives, it also shows upon their face. God said, your countenance is bearing witness of the truth. The longer one lives in sin, the deeper the lines of sin begin to show upon their countenance. The more their countenance bears witness against them until a person who is given totally over to sin uh, study the face of a derelict. Look upon the face and you see those deep marks and lines that sin has left and then contrast that with a person who has lived a life of righteousness and purity, and you can see the countenance. It testifies to that life of righteousness and purity. Now, the interesting thing to me is that the Lord has a way of erasing the lines of sin when a person receives Jesus Christ. There is a change of countenance that takes place. And God begins to erase the lines of sin and the marks of righteousness begin to show sometimes very soon after conversion. Many years ago when I was still in Bible college, I was invited by my home church in Ventura, California to hold a week-long series of meetings. And so we went up and held a week's meetings in the church. 
And many people responded to the invitation to receive Jesus Christ. On the last Sunday night that we were there, there was a man who staggered into the church. I recognized who he was because I had grown up in Ventura and he was the town drunk. This man was usually released from jail. He was always in, in and out of jail, constantly on drug charges. I mean, drunk charges, drunken in the streets. And the lines of his debauchery were all over his face. You could just see it. And of course, uh, he staggered into church and uh, I recognized him, Mr. Hurst. I'd known him. Uh, I'd seen him on the streets. I'd seen him in the gutters. I'd just a man who was marked by sin. When I gave the invitation, he staggered forward to the altar. And so I went down and I prayed with him. Smell of wine was just heavy on his breath and on his clothes, as well as vomit. And afterwards, I shook his hand. I gave him a Bible and encouraged him to just really follow the Lord. The pastor of the church called me up and asked me if I would return about a month later on a Sunday night to have a baptismal service so I could baptize those who had accepted the Lord during the week's meetings that I had there. And so we went back for a Sunday evening service and as I arrived at the church, out in front of the church, a man was waiting for me with his wife and two children. And when I got out of my car, he came up and began to hug me, kiss me on the cheek, just glowing. And he said, you, you know me, don't you? You remember me, don't you? And I said, well, help me out. I don't think I do. <laughs> and he said, I'm Mr. Hurst. And I said, I can't believe it. Dressed in a suit, his wife, his children. God had restored to him the, the, the years that the canker worm and the caterpillar had eaten. And his face was so changed, the countenance was so glowing with the love of the Lord. But I scarcely recognized the man. Oh, what a joy it is to see the work of God's Spirit in a person's life. Erasing the marks and the lines of sin. But God is saying to the nation, your countenance is bearing witness against you. The marks of sin are showing right on your face. And then God went on to say, you are declaring your sin as Sodom. You don't even seek to hide it. You become brazen in your sinfulness. Even as Sodom. You remember the story of Sodom. The Lord sent a couple of angels down to Sodom. They came in the form of men. As they arrived at the gate of the city, they were greeted by Lot, the nephew of Abraham. And Lot invited them to his home for the evening. And after dinner... As the angels were there in the home of Lot, the men of the city of Sodom began to beat on the door. And they said unto Lot, Send out the two men that we saw come into your house that we might sodomize them. They wanted to rape them in a homosexual way. And Lot said, Do not do this evil. These men are my guests. You know, respect them. And the men said, hey, we'll take care of you too. Who made you a judge over us? You think that ACT UP is something new? No, it started in Sodom. That's a club that's been going for a long time. The open, brazen admission to being a sodomite, a homosexual. There's nothing new to gay pride. It has actually sprung up at the death of every nation. It has been a very important part to the downfall of every nation. 
and there is nothing new to it at all. It is only one of those signs that tell you that the nation has come to the end of the road. It's almost gone. The Bible has a word for it. It's called wantonness. And that is the open flaunting of sin. Gay pride. And the time had come in Israel now where the acts of the Sodomites were being repeated in Jerusalem. The homosexuals and lesbians were no longer seeking to hide their aberrant sexual desires, aberrant sexual desires. And so, God said its Holocaust is coming. This is the reason why it's coming. But then God had a special message to the righteous. In verse 10, God said to Isaiah, Say to the righteous, it will be well with you. In the midst of all of the tragedy and calamity that is going to come, you that are righteous, it will be well with you. Somehow, some way, God will take care of you. In the famine and shortage that is to come, God will watch over and provide for you. I believe that our faith will be tested to the limits. But I believe that God will somehow, some way, see us through the calamities that are about to to befall the nation. I personally believe that as in the case of Lot, God will remove us before his hand of judgment falls. Even as the angels said to Lot, get out of here, get your families and get out of here, we're going to destroy this place. And then in, they, in the morning they said, hurry and get out, we cannot destroy it until you're gone. I believe that the Lord is going to remove the righteous. And so the word of the Lord to the righteous was, it will be well with you. Don't worry about the coming judgment. Don't worry about the calamities that are about to overtake the nation. It will be well with you. However, God had a word to the wicked also, and he said, whoa, it's going to be ill with you. The Bible tells us that in the last days God is going to judge the world once again for its great iniquity. Jesus in talking about it, Matthew 24, said there will be a time of great tribulation such as the world has never seen before or will ever see again. This will be the max as far as judgment is concerned. The book of Revelation spends most of its pages detailing for us the events that will take place during this great period of God's judgment from Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 18. Many details are given to us of this time of God's judgment that is going to come. It is interesting that as you read of the trumpet judgments, they seem to be in the form of uh, meteorites striking the earth. There will be a time when it says the heavens will be shaken and the stars will fall from heaven as a fig tree casteth forth its untimely fruit or tremendous meteorite showers. It's an interesting thing that this past December, January, right at the turn of the year, the earth had a close encounter with an extra-large meteorite. The meteorite was about the size of a Volkswagen, and it narrowly missed impacting the earth. It just went right behind our orbit. 
Our space scientist has, as a part of their duties, the observation of the heavens for large meteorites or asteroids that are in danger of colliding with the Earth. There are plans, if such a danger does arise, to send out rockets to try to change slightly the orbit of these meteorites or asteroids so that they will not impact the Earth. The thing that had NASA all excited and abuzz was that they didn't see this until afterwards, after it had passed and we had the near miss. But a meteorite of this size, should it impact the Earth, had it hit us, it is large enough that it would have penetrated the Earth's crust and created a cataclysmic event in which one-third of our Earth would have been wiped out. We were that close last January. They're keeping it hush-hush, but it's quite common talk among the NASA experts. The thing that troubles them is that they missed it. They didn't see it until the thing had passed. Now, as you read Revelation and you see the judgments that God has said were going to come, when the third angel sounds his trumpet, he said, There fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the earth, and a third part, I thought that was interesting that they said a third part of the earth would have been wiped out, a third part of the rivers and the fountains of waters will be destroyed. A third part of the fresh water on the earth will become unpalatable and men will die as the result of it. Um, as you read the book of Revelation, it, it's not a far-off scenario. But for you who are walking with Jesus Christ today, who find yourself with Lot, vexed by the evil of our sick society, I have a word from God for you. Though a great judgment will soon come upon the earth, it will be well with you. Though a thousand fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, it will not come near your dwelling. For he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, and they will bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. God will watch over you, and God will take care of you. You need not fear the coming Holocaust, because it will be well with you. I believe that as we look at the world today, that we are on the verge of that day which in the scripture is called the day of the Lord, the day of his wrath and judgment. I think that we're seeing the dawning of that day. Right now, even as Israel said that your government will, will be all in disarray, look at what disarray our government is in today. The House could not override the veto that the president uh, uh, vetoed the, the proposed budget. They could not override it, which means that Tuesday our government will not be functioning. The postal clerks, which were removed from government service, they will be functioning on Tuesday. Uh, the critical employees such as air traffic controllers will have to work, but for thousands upon thousands of government employees, the government will be shut down on Tuesday. The 2,000 workers of the IRS who work here at Laguna Niguel, they have to call in Tuesday to find out whether or not to come to work. The government is shutting down. This could turn out to be one of the greatest blessings we've ever experienced. <laughs> <laughs> the 
but it's in disarray. It's in shambles. They don't know what to do. They do not have the courage to cut these unnecessary programs from the budget. And we find ourselves in a black hole. You know, just sucking in. The light can't even get out. Take a look at New York City. In New York City, there are 830,000 people on welfare. That's more people than all but 10 of the largest cities in the United States. There are neighborhoods in New York where one-fourth of the people are intravenous drug users. And because of AIDS being spread through the dirty needles and the huge number of homosexuals that are in New York, the problem with AIDS has become so severe that those hospitals that were dedicated specifically for AIDS patients are now filled and they cannot take any more. They're going to have to put them in the public hospitals of New York. And it's going to strain the already overtaxed budget. 10,000 10, babies are born every year in New York with uh, drug syndromes, actually crack babies they call them. They're born with cocaine addictions and it will cost $223,000 per baby to bring them through this infancy stage. And, and they don't have the money for it. New York is broke. They are out of funds. There is lawlessness in New York to such an extent that whereas... Back in 1953, I believe it was, there was some, 1952, 8,757 robberies in New York in 1952. In 1989, there were 93,387, or there was a stick up every six minutes in New York. 200,000 people jump the turnstiles to get on the subways free. The thing is, it's down the tubes. They're facing a dilemma. There are neighborhoods that the police call war zones and even the police won't go into those neighborhoods. But it is only indicative of what's happening throughout the nation. Los Angeles isn't far behind. And it's beginning to happen all over the United States. The widespread use of drugs. The AIDS epidemic. For a long time, they were trying to sort of play down the AIDS as though we were finally winning the battle. Uh, they realized that in, in publishing the truth, too many people were getting scared and, and some of them were even beginning to be antagonistic towards the homosexuals for bringing this plague upon us. And so they, they put out the order, you know, cool it. Uh, and did you remember just a few months ago you were reading all kinds of articles in the paper how that the scientists were finding the answers, the codes, and so forth, and they were going to soon be able to create vaccines and drugs, and AIDS was not going to be a problem anymore. We're, we're going to lick it. All a bunch of hogwash. That the, the number of AIDS people were not really increasing any longer, that uh, it had sort of leveled off. We'd finally gotten a handle on this thing because we had you know, trained people in how to have sex safely. All a bunch of lies. And now the truth is coming out. AIDS is increasing at even a more alarming rate than they thought it was going to. 
and we are totally incapable of being able to handle the number of AIDS patients that are needing help. And it is breaking down the whole health system of the United States. We're in trouble. We're in big trouble. Our economy is in a shambles. We have read about the savings and loan and their failures and how it's going to take $500 billion to pull the savings and loans out of the debacle that they have become. But now, having appropriated some funds to bail out the savings and loan, they're beginning to say the banks are now failing. And the banks are now going broke. Poor judgment in making loans to foreign countries and all are threatening some of the major banking institutes of America. Citibank, in trouble. When they're in trouble, we're all in trouble. The whole economic system is on the verge of collapse. Not only that, we're facing the threat of war. Every day there are voices that are coming out of Washington saying, war is inevitable. They're only waiting till the middle of October when the weather cools down a bit and it'll be a little more comfortable to fight a war to get things going over there, according to many reports. Our law enforcement officers cannot cope with the general lawlessness that exists in our public sectors. Scandal rocks the church. And the ACLU and the PAW are seeking to drown you in moral filth. But to you who are righteous, in that righteousness which is of Jesus Christ through faith, I have a word from God for you today. Though the thing is going to go down, it will be well with you. God will take care of you. God will provide for you. And God will see you through. No evil shall befall thee or come nigh thy dwelling. God will watch over and keep you. It is interesting to me that God wanted to speak words of comfort to his people through the prophet. The words of judgment and the coming calamity were, were for the nation. It was, it, it's, it's going to come. It, it's, it's here. It's upon us. But lest God's people should be gripped with terror and fear and anxiety and panic, God has a special message for his people in the hour of darkness, and that is, it will be well with you. I will be with you. I will see you through, is the promise of God to his children. Which, incidentally, causes me to be very happy that I'm one of his children. When I look at the world today and I see the hopelessness and the dilemma, I'm so glad that he's going to see me through. I don't know how. That's not my problem. That's his. Because he promised it. He has to do it. And he will. He'll see us through. It's my prayer. It's my hope that he'll see us out rather than see us through. <laughs> and he promised to do that too. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Say to the righteous, it will be well with you. One way or the other, he'll see me through or he'll see me out, but it's going to be well 
because my trust is in him. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that we can put our trust in you this day. And Lord, we have your wonderful promises. It will be well with us. And so, Lord, we just ask now that you, by your Holy Spirit, will speak to those who are a part of the world system that is rebelling against you. And let them realize, Lord, that you're not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And that they will soon be reaping the whirlwind of God's judgment because of their rejection of your love. Father, comfort the heart of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? Oh, incidentally, those facts on New York, they didn't come out of the Enquirer <laughs> or the Globe. Um, actually, U.S. News and World Report, September 24th, 1990 issue, uh, tells about the dilemma that New York is facing right now and uh, the, the problems that they have. 500,000 drug abusers in New York City. 500,000 drug abusers. Unreal. It says all of that, and it says, now for the bad news. <laughs> and he goes on uh, to tell other things. But you know, the only safe place to live in New York is in Jesus Christ. <laughs> He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my strength, my defense, in Him will I trust. And He shall you know, deliver you and He will be with you. And, and the only safe place to live in this world today is in Christ Jesus, making Him your habitation, settling down and just... Allowing Christ to dwell in your heart by faith. To the righteous, comforting words, it will be well with you. To the wicked, words of warning, woe, it's going to be ill for you. The interesting thing is that a person is wicked or righteous by his own choice. I choose to live in rebellion against God, a life after my flesh, or I choose to surrender my life to God and live a life of obedience to him, in fellowship with him. I choose that. The wonderful thing about the fact that it is a choice is that you can change your mind. If you have been living in rebellion against God and you begin to see the, the results of it on your face, in your countenance, it's beginning to show your, your life of degradation is beginning to have its effect upon you, on your judgment, and, and it's beginning to destroy your family and things around you. You can change. You can change. You can go back to the prayer room and kneel before God and repent and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm sorry, God, for my sin and my rebellion against you. I was wrong. God, forgive me. And the wonderful thing about God is that he is gracious and merciful. And he will forgive and he will cleanse from all unrighteousness. And you will be able to escape the coming Holocaust. It will be well with you. May the Lord be with you and may he protect and keep you as you walk in fellowship with him. In Jesus' name.